Hey, Crest Chapel, it is great to be back with you after Easter. I thought it was a wonderful Easter celebration. Thank you to all of, all of you who joined us. And if you joined us for the first time at Easter and you're back with us, man, thanks so much for coming back. Uh, We're so glad that you're with us. Hope you don't call yourself a, a guest for long, but uh, uh, consider yourself a part of the Christ Chapel family. I, we hope that we can gather together again in the near future. We are listening to federal and state officials uh, about reopening, et cetera, and there are so many contingency plans in the future that we are working on, but we're working on all of those to hopefully gather together together again safely in the near future. But in the meantime, I just wanna say a special thank you to all of our medical professionals. There are so many of you that are a part of the Christ Chapel family, and even if you're just working in our city and communities, thank you so much for putting your life on the line to save ours. We know the sacrifices that you're making and we can't say thank you enough. You are modern day heroes. We are so appreciative. In fact, before all of this started, I was up at the hospital with some elders. We were doing some elder prayer and out of the three nurses that came into the hospital room, two of them went to Christ Chapel. And so, so proud of you. Thank you for what you're doing. We love you, we pray for you, and we support you. Uh, But now we're gonna jump in. I wanna ask you a question. You've heard this phrase before, so I guess I don't even have to ask it as a question. But you've heard it. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Uh, Isn't that true? I mean, if you're a mom, you probably resent that. But let me tell you, mom, it's true. If you're not happy, nobody's happy. If you have a bad attitude, man, that smells throughout the whole house. Everybody knows it, and we all wanna make mama happy. But these days, that can be said about anybody. You can fill in the blank with anybody's name that if they're not happy, then nobody's happy around the house. It doesn't matter if it's mama, daddy, brother, sister, doesn't matter who it is. If they have a stinky attitude that smells throughout the house and nobody is happy. And unfortunately, these days, it seems like nobody's happy in any kind of home. Nobody's happy with any of these circumstances. You see, when all of this started up, I think everybody was pretty optimistic. This hit about the time of spring break, and I think a lot of people that didn't know about how serious this pandemic was going to be, they kind of thought, okay, this is spring break, you know, I get kind of a staycation, get to work from home a little bit, but the longer that it goes on, the more serious we realize it's become, the less happier we are. You know, those who were not so concerned about the, the health needs and how serious the health crisis were, they're, they're all of a sudden concerned. Uh, you're wearing masks now to even the, the grocery store. You know, those who were, weren't so concerned about losing their jobs or working from home, now maybe you've lost a job. You're concerned about the economy. You're concerned that maybe your retirement's not going to be there uh, in the near future. There there are so many unknowns out there, so much uncertainty. And with so much uncertainty, it's caused us so much unrest. People are are stressed out at home these days. And we are struggling with things like we've never struggled with them before. People are struggling with with worry and anxiety. Not to mention, uh, did you know domestic violence is up? Uh, Child abuse is up. God bless those, those poor, poor children. Uh, not, not, we don't even know the, the mental health effects that are gonna be on the backside after all of this ends, Lord willing, very, very soon is what we pray for. You see, this sheltering in place that was meant to solve one problem and is helping us combat one issue is causing so many other issues. And that's why we don't only need to shelter in place, but we need to learn how to shelter in peace. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So if you would, open your Bibles to Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four is where we're gonna be as we begin a new series today called Shelter in Peace. It's all gonna be from Philippians chapter four. This is gonna be a three-week series where we're gonna talk about some different battles that we're fighting as we shelter in place. Because if we just shelter in place and try to cope with things as, uh, as they are on our own, then that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to shelter in peace. 
And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to find shelter in him. And so we're going to anchor ourselves in God's word in these first nine verses. And I know you might say, Cody, there's no way that we can spend three weeks on nine verses. Well, yes, we can. There is a lot of meat on these bones. And they're applicable to our lives today because they were applicable to to the Philippians, but also because of the context in which Philippians was written. If you remember the context of Philippians, Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul, but he is in Rome. He's nowhere close to Philippi at this time, but he's in Rome and he is actually under house arrest. You're right. He is quarantined. He is sheltered in place. He, has, he, he can't get out of his home. And as he's in Rome, in prison, under house arrest, sheltered in place, he writes this letter back to the church in Philippi, telling them the things that are most important, the things that are most important about uh, who Christ is, but also what's most important to them as a body. Because if there's one word that you could give to this book, it was probably joy, but you can have no joy if you don't have any peace. And that's what Paul does in this book is he addresses the peace that we can have in Christ. And he does that by in the first three chapters, chapters one to three, he addresses doctrine, that Christ is a firm foundation. But then he moves from belief to behavior in chapter four. And that's where we're gonna settle and put our anchor down for this series so that we learn to shelter in peace because sheltering in peace begins with standing firm in the Lord. We're never gonna shelter in peace until we shelter ourselves in the Lord. You remember the Psalms where David talks about how the Lord is our refuge, our our strength, Uh, He he is our stronghold, a tower. He's all of these strong things that the righteous run to him and we are safe. Sheltering in peace begins with sheltering in the Lord. And that's why he starts off chapter four, verse one. He says, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and I long for. Don't you wanna share everything that's most important to those whom you love and long for? My joy and my crown. He says, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. You see, no matter what trials you're facing, stand firm in the Lord. Again, Paul was imprisoned, but he was standing firm in the Lord. And this is so relevant to us today because everything that we probably used to shelter in or find peace or solace in have all been pretty much taken away from us. I mean, if, if, if you were finding peace and saying, well, Cody, I'm healthy, well, now you might be afraid for your health. That, that can be taken away very easily, or, or you found peace in the stability of a job and you no longer have a job, or you found peace in your savings account or your retirement account, and now that is just drained or cut in half. You see, all of those things, those don't, we, we can't find peace in those things, Those things you can't find shelter in. You see, what Paul is telling us is your peace will be as strong as your shelter. Your peace will only be as strong as your shelter. That means if you want immovable peace, unshakable peace, then you need an immovable, unshakable shelter. And that's why he tells the church to stand firm in the Lord. He is the one who is immutable. He's never changed. He is unshakable. He cannot be changed. He can't be moved. He loves us. And the same heart that Paul shares for the church in Philippi is the same heart that the Lord shares for us. My beloved, my joy, my crown. Stand firm in me. That's his call. And this this reminds me, this, this phrase of stand firm, reminds me of what Paul tells the church in Ephesus. If you think back to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter six, when Paul starts talking about spiritual warfare, he says, stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord so that you can guard against the devil's schemes. And folks, we are under attack in a brand new way, probably a new way that you may have never faced in your Christian life. 
All of those schemes of the devil that, want to, that, that are there to cause you to, to fear or to worry or to be anxious, all those temptations that maybe were held at bay, those all now are, are right forefront, front and center in your life. And we need to stand firm, stand firm in the Lord so that we can guard against the devil's schemes. Because see, one of the devil's schemes is to divide us relationally. You see, because every time we experience great stress in our life, which I think you would say this is a very stressful time for so many people, when we are most stressed, we are most selfish because we think that we deserve to relieve our stress in whatever way, that we can go and do whatever we want, say whatever pops out of our mouth. Just We have license to be selfish if we're stressed. And that's not true. That's a scheme of the devil that draws us into things that will not lead us to a peaceful life. In fact, it divides us against those who God has put us together with, that God wants us to, to unify with. You see, this is, this is really helpful for us when we study this because God wants us to be unified so that we can get through this together. But nothing will divide two people more than selfishness. When, when we become selfish and we start uh, asking another person to adhere to our needs, our wants, our desires, or we place expectations on them that they will uh, be our peace, that they will be our shelter, those are completely unrealistic. They were never meant to be that. God never intended them to meet those needs in us. He, is, he alone is the only one that we can shelter in peace in and no one else. But when we put those unrealistic expectations on someone or that they should be able to understand how stressed we are and they need to just deal with our selfishness, then that divides us. That's a scheme of the devil. And as Ephesians chapter six says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and rulers and principalities of the spiritual world. He's the one that we're, we're fighting. And so we need to understand that we can't shelter in people. We've got to shelter alone and stand firm in the Lord if we're gonna shelter in peace. And that, re that relates to our relationships as well. Because during this stressful time, we're all getting stressed out and we don't need to take out that stress on one another. We need to give that stress to the Lord. And so in order to shelter in peace, we're gonna have to get really good at repairing relationships. You see, sheltering in peace begins not only with standing firm in the Lord, but it requires repairing relationships. And we get a great case study of how to repair those relationships. Great Christian relationships that somehow become frayed how God unifies us again so that we get through this, not only wounded, but we get through this unified. And he gives us a case study in verse two as he introduces these two ladies in the church. And he says, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syndicate to agree in the Lord. Now you're probably saying, Cody, who are Euodia and Syndicate? Who, who are these ladies? Well, to be honest, we don't know much about them. In fact, all that we get about them is what is recorded here in Philippians. So here's what we know. We know first that they're believers. They're both believers. These are both, both Christ followers. They both love the Lord. We know that their names are written in the book of life as we find out in verse three. We know that they both go to the same church. They both belong to the same church there in Philippi. And then, and then thirdly, we know that they both labored together with, with the Lord. They, they both tried to build the church together. In fact, they may have been founding members of the church in Philippi, as we know a group of women was integral into establishing the church in that city. And so these were maybe even founding members, friends who had labored, co-labored for Christ side by side. But now something has come between them. So something has happened and now there's some discord between the two of them. And Paul, knowing this is what's most important, as I am sheltered in place, imprisoned here in Rome, let me tell you, ladies, I entreat you, I beg you, would you agree in the Lord? 
Would you get along together? In fact, what's really interesting, this word entreat that he uses twice, which by the way, means that he doesn't choose sides. Just a fun fact for you there. He entreats both of them. He doesn't say one is wrong and one is right. He just encourages them to work it out. But this word entreat is actually the word parakaleo, which is the word where, that we are, that Jesus described the Holy Spirit with. When we, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete or the helper or encourager or comforter, he says, that's what I need you to do. I need you to parakaleo, Judea, and I need you, I parakaleo you, Syndicate, to agree in the Lord. I encourage you. I, 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 it would give you great comfort if you would agree together, if you would stop being disunified and at each other's throats, but that you would come together and be unified. That's what he is calling them to do. We've got to learn to repair relationships because guess what? Your peace will depend on whether you repair your relationships. Your peace will be dependent on whether or not you repair your relationships. You see, sometimes we, uh, uh, and not, not satisfactory to do this, but sometimes we say, you know what, that's just their issue and we let it go. And sometimes people have issues that you just have to let go, you can't control people. Totally understand that. But what he is calling these people to do that should be like-minded to come together. And w your peace, your comfort, your encouragement will come through unifying with the body of Christ. And those are believers that you might even be sheltered with at this time. In fact, what Paul is talking about here when he asked them to, to agree in the Lord, it's actually the same phrase that he uses in Philippians chapter two, verse two, just, just earlier in the same book. He, he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Having the same mind, this is agreeing in the Lord. He says, this is how you're gonna have to do this, but you can't do that without the mind of Christ. The way we begin agreeing in the Lord is having the mind of Christ. That leads us to maturity. That leads us to humility. That leads us to gentleness as we have the mind of Christ. That's why he says, agree in the Lord, because we're never gonna agree with everybody on everything in life. But on the majors, we need to find agreement in the Lord because that's what he's calling us to be in Christ. And so what I wanna do with this sermon and with it, actually this entire series is I wanna be very, very practical. I'm gonna give you some practical things that you can apply in your home as you're sheltered in place so that you can therefore shelter in peace. So I wanna give you some very practical things that you can do. With, hopefully there's no conflict at home right now. I mean, you're probably perfect. I, I can't relate to you, but you probably are. Uh, but in case you hit a snag relationally, then here are some things that, that you can apply and they come from this passage. So the first one is this. Determine if the discord is a real problem or a preference. First, you as an individual, if you find conflict with someone else, determine if the discord is a preference or if it's a real problem. And here's why I say that. Because when he talks to Yodia and Syndicate, he doesn't mention what the problem is. Now, I told you, Paul has spent the first three chapters talking about doctrinal issues. These, those are the things that are most important to the church. Now, if they were disagreeing about some doctrinal issue, he probably would have mentioned that. He probably would have said, uh, would you get along with the Lord? Uh, see chapter one, verse whatever. But he doesn't. He just says, would you agree in the Lord? Which means it was probably something that wasn't doctrinal. It wasn't a, a real problem. It was just a preference. And so often we can do that in our lives. We make preferences real problems. Uh, or, or as my parents used to say, we can make mountains out of molehills. We make things bigger than they ought to be. And see, that if we can determine whether this is a preference or a real problem, then we can cut it off at the pass. It, it, we don't even have to enter into a conflict because we resolve it and settle it as our own. Let me give you an example. How many of you know how to load the dishwasher? 
Okay, see, if you don't know what I'm asking, then you don't know how to load the dishwasher because I promise you there is a correct way to do that and I know how to do that. I, I know the correct way to load the dishwasher. And early on in my marriage, Jen and I's marriage, we, we would oftentimes talk about how to load the dishwasher. And I learned very early on that if I preferred a certain way to load the dishwasher, then I could do it myself. You see, that, that caused us to not fight any longer. You see, if I have a preference, I can just go do it myself. I don't have to try to teach her my preference or make her bend to my, the way that I like things done. It's just, there was no fight. Hey, Cody, if you want it done your way, then you do it. Very simple. But see, you cut it off at the pass. And before you go in with, and take the gloves off, first, determine if it's a real problem or if it's just a preference of yours. See, principles we hold on to, we stand on. Preferences you can, you can let go of. You gotta determine what is at stake. Next, fight against disunity rather than one another. Fight against disunity rather than one another. You see, what is most important, and that's why I went back to Philippians chapter two, what was most important that Paul was encouraging the church to do was to have the mind of Christ, which is to be of one accord, have the same mind, have the same love. It's unity. That, that's what is most important, not whatever issue Euodia and Syndicate were fighting about. That's not most important. The, the, what's imperative, what is at the top priority? Unity. And that's what we need to fight for. And if, if you're married, I'm going to encourage and I'm gonna challenge you. If you're, if, you're, if you're a guy, guys, here's what you need to do in your marriage. You need to take the initiative to fight for the right thing, and that's unity. You need to fight for unity in your marriage. And sometimes the best way to fight for unity is to determine the common enemy is disunity. You see, so often in fights, we fight face to face. You, you bicker, you argue, you, you do whatever face to face. And what we need to do is turn shoulder to shoulder. And we need to find a common enemy out there rather than making one another each other's enemies. Turn side to side, get shoulder to shoulder and say, the enemy out there is X. It's not us, it's that. And sometimes the only way that you can find common ground is if the enemy is disunity. I mean, there have been times when Jen and I have been talking plenty of times before, and I just said, or she said to me, we've both said it to one another, I don't like the way we're talking with one another right now, or I don't like, the, I don't like that we're upset with each other. Oh, well, neither do I. Wow, we just agreed. Well, you start with agreement, you start with common ground. We don't like the way things are right now. That's great common ground. Fight against disunity rather than fighting against one another and find that common ground. And that common ground begins with finding the common enemy. Next, handle today like it will be remembered forever. Handle today like it will be remembered forever. I just, uh, take, take a deep breath. I want you to think about this for a second. This conflict going on between Yodia and Syndicate gets to Paul, who's imprisoned, under house arrest, sheltered in place in Rome. Now, Philippi to Rome is about 4,600 miles. And remember, they didn't have internet or email or anything like that. So this had gotten so bad that it travels, this news, 4,600 miles. And it doesn't only, this conflict doesn't only reach Paul over 4,600 miles, it's reached us over 2,000 years. What is so bad that they couldn't work it out, that it would have to travel 4,600 miles and over 2,000 years? I mean, I, I know many of you have things that you're waiting to ask the Lord when you get to heaven, but one of the things I wanna do when I get to heaven is I wanna find these gals. You know, I just imagine, you know, in heaven, I'm walking on these streets made of gold, and, you know, I cross paths with Yodia, and I'm like, hey, Yodia, and she's like, what'd you call me? Bad joke. But she, you know, I, I get her attention, and I'm like, hey, Yodia, 
what was it that was so bad that you and Syndicate couldn't get along? I mean, we're, we were talking about it 2,000 years after you two. What, what was it? I mean, can you imagine, is any answer going to suffice in heaven? Anything. I, I, I just imagine, she's like, well, Cody, since you asked, I told her that I was gonna bring a seven-layer dip to the church potluck. And guess what? She brought a seven-layer dip to the church potluck and beat me to it. And that just ripple effect, you know, and you're just like, really? Like, I was expecting some, like, real housewives moment or something like that. Like, it was just crazy. But really? We, we held on to whatever it is for that long that all we will ever know until we see them face to face, glorified in the Lord, in heaven, all we know is that they couldn't get along. Is that how you wanna be remembered? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's certainly not how I wanna be remembered. I don't wanna have any sort of conflict like this, that that's all I'm remembered for. And if you think no one will remember it, let me tell you one group that will always remember it, and that's your kids. Doesn't matter how old your kids are, they will always remember the conflict that you have with other people. They look up to you. They, they watch how you handle situations. They wanna know how to repair relationships because conflict is real and happens. They'll always remember. So guess what? Handle today like it's gonna be remembered forever because the way they handled their today is remembered forever and it's not favorable on either of them. And then finally, enlist the help of others when necessary. Enlist the help of others when necessary. Now, you see, if they would have worked it out individually, we probably would never know who Yodi and Syndicate are, ever. But it had festered like a bad splinter and caused an infection that ended up getting out to the entire community. And, and what they needed to do was enlist some help. And, and let, first, let me tell you, the first person you enlist, go back to uh, verse two, agree in the Lord. The first person that you ask for help from is the Lord. Like, you need to just go and pray. There, there have been many times where Jen and I have been talking and we go, time out. This is over the course of our marriage, but time out. We need to just go to our separate corners and pray. And oftentimes when we do that, we come back much, we're much gentler people. We're, it, it, the conflict, all the, all the tension has settled a little bit and we're able to just calmly evaluate everything. You know, that's, that's the time out that you need. You need to go and consult the Lord. But also you might need to enlist some other outside help. And, and that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for as pastors, as, as different folks that work at our church. We're happy to help you. But let me just go ahead and gauge your expectations of, of what we're going to do. Because oftentimes, especially with married couples, what they expect us to do is to come in and be a judge. And, and to you, I said, you go to separate corners. Uh, you know, let me use a boxing analogy. Uh, boxing fights are judged they're judges who sit outside the ring and they score points. That was a hit, that was a hit, that was a hit. And if a decision ever goes to the judges, then it's a subjective decision. One party is happy that they're declared a winner and another party is dissatisfied that they weren't declared the winner. There's a, there's a winner and a loser. And you see, when you enlist outside help, what you don't want us to do is to be a judge, honestly. We don't need to declare a winner. What you need to enlist is a referee. Referee is in the middle of the ring with you. A referee calls fouls. A referee says, that was below the belt. You, you can't do that. Because the whole issue here is not finding a winner or a loser. You see, the big win is that you realize that you're both on the same team. That you're not against each other. That's not why the Lord has put you together. To win or to lose. See, so often we get caught up in fighting the battle and we lose the war. That's why if we are going to shelter in peace, you have to keep the big picture in mind. You've gotta keep the big picture in mind. 
All of these things of how you will be remembered in heaven, how, how the Lord remembers these things, you've got to think about how this mushrooms out to those that are in your sphere of influence, how it's affecting your conversations, how it's affecting your life. I mean, think about it. I, I, I wrote this down that of, of, of how disunity affects us personally. Disunity gives us a critical spirit, a negative attitude, bitterness, revenge, hostility, unforgiveness, and pride. And that's not sheltering in peace in any way. And I think that's why he says in verse three, he says, yes, that yes, honestly, gives you a sense of urgency. Yes, urgently. I ask you also, true companion, that was probably a specific person that he's talking to there. Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together. Oh, time out. I want you to see this word labored. This word labored is actually a term used for war. That, that they had battled together side by side. They had battled for the Lord. Now they're battling against one another. He says, I want you to help them. They had battled together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. He says, whose names are in the book of life. You see, he wanted them to keep a bigger perspective. That ladies, listen, this conflict is involving Clement, Epaphroditus, who was the deliverer of this letter. It's involving other, ch other church members, the true companion, whoever that is. It's involving way too many people and all of these are, have their names written in the book of life. You know what? Guess what? Keep the bigger picture in mind. We're all gonna be in heaven together. You better learn how to get along. We're all gonna be sheltered in peace with the Lord for eternity. We might as well get good practice at it now. And we're gonna have to do that because guess what? Your peace will rest in your submission to the ultimate peacemaker. And until you submit to the ultimate peacemaker who has given you peace with God through his son, Jesus Christ, the one who is going to bring us together and all those whose names are written in the book of life, then you're never gonna find peace. You have to submit your life to him. And what he wants is unity for his children. You see, because it's true. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's true. But another one that applies, if daddy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You see, if our heavenly father isn't happy, then you're not gonna be happy. And what makes him happiest is when his children play together well. I know you've probably realized that as we've been sheltered in place. You just want your kids to get along. That's every parent's heart. And that's the Lord's heart for you as well. That you would play well together. That you would be unified. That you would agree with one another. Not in everything, but at least in the Lord. That you would respect one another. That you would treat one another as God has treated you. Until we do that, we're never gonna shelter in peace. We'll only be able to shelter in place. And God wants more for your life than that. He wants us to come out on this other side, not wounded by one another, but more unified with each other. Now, I know as I've studied this message, this has brought up a lot of things that I just need to pray about. And that's why I've asked our West Campus pastor, Matt Lance, to lead us all in a time of prayer. When I was in seminary, I had a professor who would remind us repeatedly, and he would say, when you're, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, then it doesn't work. In other words, he was telling us over and over again, hey, you know what, if you know a lot about the Bible, or if you pray all the time, or if, if you're in charge of a lot of things, but you can't love people at home the way that Jesus has loved you, then you've got some room to grow as a Christ follower. I don't know what the quarantine's been like for you and your family, but in the Lance household, we've been slowly but surely realizing that we all have a little bit of room to grow. So we need to pray. We need to ask the Lord to make us into the kinds of people that have the same selflessness and humility as our Lord Jesus. So if you'll bow with me, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. You know, Cody brought up Philippians chapter two, and in it, we have the example of Christ. And Paul encourages us there. He says, 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourself. So let's take a moment and let's ask the Lord to cultivate in our hearts attitudes of selflessness and humility. Now we need to be honest with God about how we haven't been selfless this week, about how we've been prideful, about how we haven't loved others the way that Jesus has loved us. So let's be honest with ourselves and let's be honest with God. Let's confess the ways we've not treated others the way that Jesus has served us. And of course, one of the first ways that we can repair the relationships in our lives is offering forgiveness. But a lot of times forgiveness needs to be offered while the other person is still yet a sinner. That's of course the way that Jesus has treated us. So do you need to forgive someone? Let's take a few moments and ask for the Lord's help to do that now. Finally, Paul concludes and he says, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So let's ask God to make us into the kinds of people who love others the way that Jesus has loved us, who don't seek to be served, but to serve. Well, our Father in heaven, you have revealed to us through the perfect example of your son Jesus that unity as a family first begins with humility. And we count one another as more important than ourselves. Father, would you use these days in quarantine to make us into families who are united in the way that we love each other? Would you keep the example of Christ ever before us so that we can love the way that he first loved us? Father, we ask these things the only way we know how, and that is in the great and glorious name of Jesus. Amen.